Amen. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, guys, for being here, being hungry to be here. Whatever it took you to get here, however far you had to travel, just thanks. Go to John 8 with me real quick, please. Wow. Everybody doing good? Wow. We're just going to get started. They kept singing a phrase over and over and over and over. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. And I saw some of you hopping and jumping and bouncing and dancing. I just wanted to, hey, buddy. Hi. Sorry, I'll, family reunion stuff. I'll be like, hey. Uh, I want to just get it over with right now. Just look around. <laughs> just hi, everybody. <laughs> let's do something. I feel this in my heart. Can we stand to our feet? Let's just yield the Holy Spirit right now. And let's just, I know we've already prayed and stuff, but just personally, Pastor Rick had you do this earlier and just get real quiet. And it just feels right just kicking this off, standing up here. Just, just commune with him. Just make yourself totally available for this whole week. And just ask the Lord to do whatever he desires in your heart right now. You tell the Lord you have ears to hear. You have a heart to obey and respond to the Holy Spirit. Just ask him that you see the word so clear. That this gospel would come alive in you. That your eyes would open wide. Father, I ask that for myself as well. All of us, God. We just submit to you. Surrender to you. Great and wonderful Holy Spirit. Have your way. We honor you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit, just the way we love the way you honor Jesus. We love the way you reveal Jesus to our hearts. We love the way you only do what the Father's doing and saying, thank you, Holy Spirit, for living inside of us and walking among us. We yield you. That testimony Chad shared, we receive the grace that would spontaneously give us wisdom this week and understanding, spontaneously give us discernment. We receive the grace. That testimony he shared, Father, where he says, I don't even know what's going on. We just thank you that you just drop in on us, just drop in our hearts, just wisdom for the moment, words of knowledge, discernment, understanding in the moment, Lord God, that we would see people and your love would overtake our hearts and that, Lord God, our understanding would fill up with exactly what to say. Lord, we surrender to you that we might rightly represent you, and we just thank you. You are the great potter, and you are making us more and more and more and more and more like you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Thanks, guys. Just felt like praying a little. Just yielding. It's a good idea. John 8. Verse 31, I'm excited about this. I just want to talk about this just a second. Uh, We kept singing that phrase, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. You you can find that in John 8. And uh, I want you to see what he's really talking about, okay? Because when we were born, when every one of us was born, the Bible says in Romans 5, we were born into Adam. We were born into the fall of man. We were, man, we were born into what Adam became when he sinned, okay? Okay? And the Bible says you must be born again. I'm real foundational with you this morning. I'm going to be real simple, but don't don't just think, well, I already know this. Let's just stay engaged, okay? It's real foundational. Power and love conferences, a lot of times we, we call them identity conferences. If we see who we are, we'll live that way. And then we won't have to try to minister. There's a big difference. If, you'll, if you know who you are, you'll just live who you are. Or you're trying to minister. And what we like to do is just let people become so they're empowered to do rather than just teach you all this stuff to do. And then you really don't know who you are and then you have to do to feel good about yourself and it's backwards. And then if you're not doing well, you sure don't feel good and now you have to really spruce up and try to do better so you can feel good. Or you need somebody to appreciate you so you feel good. I'm so appreciated, it's ridiculous. (laughs) Jesus shed his blood for me so the life his life could come inside of me like God the father loves me and knows who I am and he honestly thinks that my life and your life is worth the death of his son this is a pretty big deal (laughs) come on my whole life my whole life I heard the gospel preached this way that Jesus died on the cross and I'm not playing words listen Jesus died on the cross because you're a sinner because you're a sinner Jesus died on the cross because you're a sinner and that's what I heard my whole life And when you talk like that in the church, people think, well, yeah, okay, this guy's about ready to blaspheme. No, he died on the cross. He had to die because we committed sin. But he died on the cross because we're lost sons and daughters. 
He didn't die on the cross because we're sinners. He died on the cross because we're lost sons and daughters. He died on the cross to become what we were so we could become what he is so he could get his spirit back in us. He didn't die on the cross to take us to heaven. He died on the cross to get heaven back inside of us. This isn't a passport to heaven. God forbid we reduce this thing to just a prayer to go to heaven someday. It's the transformation of life. It's, It's back one with the Father through the Son. I'm restored back to the beginning as a sin never was. Come on. Redemption means brought back to original value. Justification means just as if you've never sinned. Romans 6 says, reckon yourself dead to sin but alive unto God. He won a battle. We should stop trying to fight it. He already won it. Let's just put on what he accomplished. Start there and run well. Come on. The days of guilt, condemnation, and shame have to be over for every Christian that understands. Just has to be over. Come on, the fact that you even have the potential to be condemned means your heart's alive and you care. There's nothing wrong with you. God's just sanctifying and setting apart some things in our life. We're growing up into him. So if we're doing something in our life that's violating us, we deal with that in our relationship with God, not through guilt, condemnation, and shame, biting our lip and trying harder. We go to God and say, this is not who I am. This is not who you created me to be. And I thank you that your grace in my life is greater. And there's enough light in me to expose this thing that it is not who I am in you and who you are in me. And Father, thank you for transforming me. As you run to God, not like Adam and Eve run from God, but as you run to God, grace comes into your life to empower you, to make you what your heart's crying out to be. So guilt, condemnation, and shame's never the answer. So the fact that you even have the potential to be guilty, condemned, and ashamed means you really do care and the gospel's touched you in a way that there's purity inside of you. Because if you were nonchalant and didn't care, you wouldn't be able to be condemned. But if the devil can trick you into condemnation instead of just true conviction that brings change, that's trouble. Because now you're beat down when your heart's crying to be lifted up. When you want to do better. Who's ever done something in your life now that you knew the truth and you did something and then you felt really bad about it and you carried that around for a while? Let me see who's ever related to that. Okay, now I set y'all up. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> Did you see how, how unanimous that was? Because we think that's normal, but it's the way that seems right to a man. And the way that seems right to a man produces death all the time. The way that seems right never produces life. But truth brings life. Truth makes you free, and truth's in Jesus Christ. So he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world and set the world free. So if he did not send his son to condemn the world, what are we doing toying with it? So condemnation's never the answer. Yay. (laughs) Is that permission to live flagrant? Are you kidding me? The love of God and the goodness of God's designed to change my life. It puts integrity in me. The gospel, if it's preached clear, puts a desire and a want to and a sobriety and a sincerity in your heart. We should never be afraid to preach the finished work of Christ and the righteous judgment of God because it puts a diligence in me. It puts a discipline in me. It puts a want to in me because he's amazing. This isn't a permission to stay the same. It's not a permission to sin and get away with it. It's a reason to be changed, to be free from sin. You follow me? So I'm just going to keep preaching the gospel this way and living this way and just trust that some people run along. (laughs) Serious, I don't know about you, but the gospel all my life that I heard that says Jesus died on the cross because you're a sinner left me with a sin consciousness and an awareness of what's wrong with me and what feels like will never change. And I wake up with me every day instead of Christ in me. And now I'm trying to get to somewhere he already paid the price to present me. I'm trying to earn something that's already given. So I'm under this pressure that I can never get through. I can never perform enough to get through this bubble. He called me out of that place, out of darkness, into light, into the kingdom of the son of his love. So I have to start there. Guys, who the sun set free is free indeed. What's he talking about? He's talking about free from sin. I'm going to show you. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciple indeed. Verse 31 of John 8. That's pretty awesome. If you abide, that means live, remain, and dwell in my word. Not human reasoning, not human opinion, not hearsay, not just somebody else's idea and opinion, but the word of the living God. Come on, it's a big deal. 
you abide in my word, live, remain, dwell in my word, you are my disciple indeed. That's awesome. Jesus said, go make disciples of every nation. He didn't say, go make confessing Christians. I'm not being smart, I'm being real. He didn't say, go make confessing Christians. He said, go make disciples, disciplined learners, wholehearted followers. He's defining a disciple in John 8. He said, a disciple is somebody that continues, lives, abides, and remains in my word. Not his feelings, not his emotions, not his own ideas, and not what seems right in the moment, but who God is through what God says. That's a disciple. So he's a single-eyed person. He's not multiple choice, wide view lens. He's not optional. (laughs) Come on. His eyes very single. Matthew 6, 22, Luke 11, 34 says, if my eye is single, my whole body's flooded with light. Doesn't say unless, of course, I'm faced with many issues and challenges. It says if I see clear, I live clear. If my eye is single, my body's body's flooded with light. Unless, of course, you just got laid off, your spouse just left you, or you just had a traumatic experience. It doesn't say that. It says if I see clear, I live clear, because truth makes me free, and faith releases grace. God is way bigger than the life that we're surrounded by. And if you'll let the word get a lot louder than what life is screaming, you will be okay in the middle of hell and high water. And you'll be able to manifest Jesus in it all. And you'll keep your joy till the end. I'm 17 years saved, I'm getting worse all the time. (laughs) Serious, this flame is not just barely flickering. Oh, it's been a hard long run, brother. Life's been challenging. No, Jesus is amazing. Amen. <laughs> the next time you see me, which is going to be this afternoon, <laughs> I'll probably be this way or worse because <laughs> I might know him just a little bit more. <laughs> you have to be careful you don't let life define who you are and let life get louder than the gospel. The things you see are subject to change, the things in this book are eternal. We have to grow up into him, guys. We have to prove we're not 30-day money-back guarantee, 60-day try me, see if you like me Christians. We're not in this for us and our sake. We're in this for his glory and his name. We denied ourselves, picked up our cross, and we're following the king. We're not in this to test God or to see if God's faithful. He's faithful. We trust he's faithful. We're in this to give our lives to him so who he is in us can manifest. So the days of complaining and everything are over if I understand why I'm a Christian. It's not about getting disappointed. It's about living in faith. It's about trusting God. And when everything looks wrong, you stay in right disposition, right attitude, right perspective. Why? So light keeps shining through you and people see and understand what true Christianity is. Anybody can fall apart when everything's falling apart. But I don't think Jesus is scattered in pieces. There's just a way that seems right to a man and there's a way that's right in the gospel. We denied ourselves, guys. We didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. We denied ourselves. We're picking up our cross. That means we're taxiing through every injustice, every unfairness, everything that didn't go our way and we're not letting anything change who we are because he doesn't change. And then we're gonna follow Jesus just like he did because he's living, breathing, walking love and greater love hath no man than this. He would lay down his life for another. (laughs) We're not in this for blessings and full vats and full barns. I know we've taught all that stuff. We're in this to manifest the nature of God. We're in this to reveal the heart of God and if you have other ideas, life is gonna disappoint you. And you might even think you have a beef or issue with God somewhere along the way. (laughs) He's given you everything necessary to be like him. That's what it's always been about. If you read this book, that's all it's ever been about, following Jesus. Not having a better day, following Jesus. (laughs) It's always been about when you're squeezed, Jesus comes out. I don't know why we made all these promises of a better life. The life is obviously better because light's inside of you and life's finally in you and you have communion fellowship with God. But sometimes it's at the cost of everything. Sometimes there's great injustice all around you. Sometimes people just make bad choices and do bad, unfortunate things. 
Isn't it amazing how those things never change Jesus, never change truth? Those things don't ever have to change you. You can walk free all the days of your life. You don't ever have to be in unforgiveness again because you clearly understand and see why you're alive. People never should have the power to dictate and jurisdict who you are and dominate your life. People are not your barometer. Life and circumstances are not the measuring line of your day. It's the one that lives inside of you and why. If people aren't living right, it's because they don't know who they are. That shouldn't make you mad, that should make you cry. Not for yourself, for them. If people aren't living right, guys, it's because we don't see, forgive them, Father, they know not what they. So see, if we don't get that straight, we're not even gonna be able to love people. Because people are a problem. People aren't a problem. They just need to see. Forgive them, Father, they know not. They might not know who you are, but you can know who you are. They not, might not know who they are, but you can know who they are through the word of the living God. Every person was created in God's image to, to be in God's image. I mean, man was created in God's image in the beginning. Do you understand that? Let us make man in our image. So what's the will of God for man? The image of God. The day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. Did he fall over dead when he ate the tree in the garden? So what died? He did who he was, you die. Who you are will die. Who Adam was in God, the image of God, a son, the nature of God when he ate the tree and walked away from the command of God and ate the tree and stepped out on his own to be a God unto himself. The day you eat the tree, you'll be like God. He was already in his likeness. Died. Every one of us was born in that identity crisis. Every one of us was born not knowing who we were and we're trying to find ourselves all the way through life. That's why you're so hurt. That's why you're so offended. That's why you're so afraid. That's why it feels so bad when you're in grade school and people laugh at you for something, for the shoes you wore. And that's why it hurts you and it makes you feel dumb and because we have no clue who we are and life is deciding that all along the way. And we're cut off from love, the source of love, so we're looking for it everywhere. God is love. And love is only found in him. You have to start there if you're gonna be secure. You gotta start there if you're gonna really understand. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. When you see his son, you've already seen the father. So Jesus is the ta-da of God. He came like the Father is. And he lived what we were designed and created for. He had never said, follow me. So Jesus modeled a life you were created for. And he's the redeemer. He brought us back and got us back on track. He's redeeming us back to what? Back to the image. He's redeeming us back to the image. He's not paying a price to just take us to heaven. He's redeeming us back to the image of God. Colossians proves that. It says, you don't lie to one another. Why? Because you put off the old man and his deeds. That's what we became through Adam. We put him off. And we put on the new man. Who's the new man in Colossians 3, verse 10? Renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So what's Christianity? A restoration back to the heart of God from selfishness to love. (laughs) From me, myself, and I to all about him. Why do you deny yourself first? Because you were never made for you. You're made for the image of God and you're the biggest problem of your life and you think it's your neighbor. (laughs) The only reason you think it's your neighbor because it's all about you. Are you guys all right? Are you glad you came? (laughs) See, it's fun, because if you want truth, this kind of message is exciting. If you don't want truth, it's still exciting, because something's going to get in you and start chewing away, man. (laughs) 
Because <laughs> you'll just have to think about it. <laughs> you, can, you can fight what I'm saying, but it won't, it won't, you can't shout it down. It'll just get you. You lay in your bed in the quiet of the night. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm having so much fun. <laughs> If any man come after me, Matthew 16, let him first, what? Deny himself. Why? It's the biggest problem. It's not the devil. It's not people. It's living for you. The ability to be offended, discouraged, disappointed, jealous, pride. That wasn't the way God made us. That's the way man became when he made a choice apart from truth. And every man was born into that lie. And you must be born again. We've turned it into a confession instead of a transformation. (laughs) So our names are in a book and we're still wrecked and hurt and offended and life's still tough and when are we going to catch a break, God? (laughs) And we build a bunch of churches, buildings. These aren't churches. These are meeting houses, which is awesome. It's not a play on words. You're the church. But we've built buildings all over the nation and we go and pay homage to God when he wants to manifest himself through us and reveal himself through us. You don't go pay homage to God. You manifest him. People see him in your eyes, your face, your words, your life. Your epistles written on the hearts of men. Your life is the sermon. You live loud. And manifest Jesus. Did you get it? He paid the price for you to do that. Listen, you're going to hear this kind of stuff all week long. You're going to get, pastor said you're going to get stretched. I believe we always get stretched. If we just read the Bible, it'll, it'll stretch our flesh and soul, right? And that's all right. I want change. I don't know about you. I want change. I want change way more than I want blessing. I pursue change because in change, there's so much blessing. It's ridiculous. <laughs> That self thing's a big deal. It's got to get out of the way. Living for yourself is the only reason you could be offended, hurt, frustrated, angry. Man, if God was that way at all, we'd be dust. He'd have never sent his son. He'd still be waiting for us to change. Instead, he came and did what's necessary to change us in his sight. Come on. There's people, if I take a survey in this room, you knew to do right and did wrong, and knew to do right and did wrong, and knew to do right and did wrong, and if God had the mentality that people had, he'd just toasted us a long time ago. He'd have wrote us off a long time ago. He'd have said, there's no hope for you. If you didn't change by now, you're never going to change. And he'd have just gave up on you, wouldn't he? But love never fails, does it? I want to be like that. I don't just want to receive that. I want to become that. I don't want to be, watch, I'm not being mean. Bear with me. It's just the way I hear it in my heart. I don't want to be so selfish that I can receive all these things from God without the desire to become those things for others. That would be selfish, wouldn't it? That I would want God to forgive me of everything I've ever done, and yet I can't forgive you of something you've done. But I expect God, because of who we preach him to be, to forgive everything I've ever done. But I can't forgive you. The Bible calls that an evil and wicked servant who's bound in outer darkness and tormented in his mind. (laughs) You might not need as much deliverance as you think. You might just need to become the heart of God. (laughs) and Stop trying to receive from him what you're not willing to become. Do yourself a justice. Why do I receive mercy? God gives me mercy and pours out mercy so I become a merciful man. Why do I receive forgiveness? God gives me forgiveness so I become living forgiveness. Why does he love me unfailingly? So I become unfailing love. So that God can reproduce himself after his own kind by as many as would believe. And you are the body of Pretty clear, huh? You are the embodiment of Christ. So how do people know him? Through you. He says if you forgive, men will be forgiven. If you don't forgive, men won't be forgiven. Isn't that amazing? 
Because it's through us that they see love. It's through us that they understand mercy. If we become legalistic, if we become hard-headed, if we just become preachers with the bullhorn that tells people turn or burn, you let people, you let life, you let ministry harden your heart. There's pastors, man. They let people hurt them. If I'm in this for what you can do for me, I'm in trouble. I'm in this for how I can lay down my life and impart something to someone. And there's nothing expected in return. Do you get it? Come on, if Jesus didn't live that way, he couldn't have broke bread on the night he was betrayed. He's standing at the table, cutting covenant, breaking bread, and he knows Judas is selling him out. He knows Peter's about to deny him. He knows John's gonna run so hard he's gonna zip right out of his clothes. He knows that when he's struck, men are gonna scatter. And yet on the night he's betrayed, he breaks bread and cuts covenant. On the night we're betrayed, we're crying, calling a friend, talking all about it. (laughs) And then our prayer is, God, why did you let them do that to me? God, I thought you loved me. Why do you let them spew all over me, God? When am I going to catch a break, God? Come on, that's our common prayer at large. And it's back to all about us. And all of a sudden, we've incorporated God into our life for a better one instead of a transformed one. I was in a service uh, recently preaching like this and a young man went home and the spirit of the Lord came upon him and said, you have been the CEO of Jesus Incorporated and you're fired. (laughs) He said, there's no incorporation of me. (laughs) You don't incorporate me into your life. You've been the CEO and you are fired. (laughs) I love those kind of encounters. (laughs) Just driving in your car and the presence of God comes in your car. (laughs) if you remain and abide and live in my word you're my disciple you shall know that that word has a lot to do with the understanding of the heart knowing it's not just gnosis it it has a whole lot to do with like experiential understanding like (gasps) knowing it's through communion it's through continuing the word the lights come on you know what I mean not just because you feel God's love, you know God's love. Do you get what I'm saying? See, we get so sensual roots sometimes we think to feel is to know. No, to know is to know. You get alone with him long enough and you start believing that he loves you and you start communing with him from the place that he does. Grace comes, it's grace. You're saved by grace through faith. As you release faith in the truth, grace comes and makes truth your reality. The lights come on, that's all I can tell you. It's the easiest way I can explain it. You start walking when nobody's looking in a room and you start thanking God that he sees you as if you've never sinned and in his sight you're clean and holy and blameless and above reproach and you look at me, God, with great destiny and great desire and I thank you, you have justified my life and you are mine and I am yours and we are one. I worship you. That's prayer, that's communion. You get alone, you start praying and talking to Holy Ghost like that and to Jesus and the Father like that. Something happens called grace. It comes inside of you and it goes, and all of a sudden what you're saying you believe, you know. And nobody can ever take it. Do you see how goofy I am right now, man? (laughs) I feel goofy. I hope I don't look as goofy as I feel. (laughs) But I feel fuzzy and happy inside. You know why? Because I start communing like that, it's real to me. I start talking like this, it's what I live every day. So I'm talking from reality, from God, from knowing. I'm not preaching a sermon to you. Where'd that come from? Time with him when you weren't looking. Just driving in my car, believing the gospel, talking to him like he's right there. Not praying for stuff and not asking him to change people. Thanking him for loving me and making my life so worth living. Seeing the value in my destiny that he would redeem it with the price of his own blood. 
See, the gospel doesn't expose your sin. The gospel removes your sin to expose your value so you can get on with life in him. I don't know about your background, but in my life, no one ever preached to me what I preach from pulpits all over this country. They just preached what they were told, that he died on the cross because I'm a sinner. I'm always gonna be. It's amazing he receives me. It's a wonder he would love me. Receive him and believe on his sacrifices. Someday you can go to heaven. And now I'm left with the same old, same old, but at least one day a bus, I hope, is gonna pick me up. That is not the gospel. The gospel is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead coming to live inside and take residence inside of you. It's the kingdom of God at hand. Where is it you're looking at it? (laughs) That's why Chad could hear like that. We were just on the elevator coming here, Todd and I, he took off, ran to the gym for a little, and he'll be in in a moment, but we're just on the elevator and a guy walks in. He says, hey man, Todd says, hey man, your, your knee's hurting, isn't it? Your right knee's hurting. Yeah. He said, yeah, you're Muslim, aren't you? He says, yeah. He said, you know, I couldn't know that. I couldn't know that you're right. And it's not like you're, I just couldn't know that unless I heard that in my heart. He, yeah. He said, man, dude, you're gonna love this. You're just gonna love this. The elevator door opens and we walk out. He says, no, no, wait there. Just, he said, hold my stuff. So I'm holding all his stuff. I'm holding Todd's stuff. He had a bunch of stuff. <laughs> he just kneels down, prays for his knee. He said, it's getting all warm inside, isn't it? He says, uh, yeah. He says, check it, man. He goes, he looks at me. Check it again. Wow, no pain, no. He says, is it really warm? He said, it feels like it's burning. And Todd laughed. He said, now listen, you're not a practicing Muslim, are you? You say you're Muslim, but you don't even practice anything. He says, no. He says, listen, man, Jesus showed me about your knee. Jesus is awesome. He said, it was interesting. He said, watch how important this contact is. He said, I've I've always believed in Jesus. That's why I don't practice what I was raised in because I'm kind of torn because I believe in Jesus. But now he experienced Jesus. Do you see the power and love thing? Yeah. Isn't that cool? So here's a guy searching. He's not some evil, wicked. He's searching. He has his heart in turmoil. He's been raised in something, and he's going, uh, huh, uh. And all of a sudden, he bumps into Jesus in the flesh. Yes, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yep. Don't think that's blasphemy. The body of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Glory, any manifest attribute of God. The Christ in you, the hope of manifesting God. So he might not just be waiting for a dream in the middle of the night. Thank God if that happens. Those things are cool. He might be waiting for you in the elevator, knowing who you are and being confident to give him what you believe. Do you get it? (laughs) Okay. It's really fun. If you live and abide and remain in my word, you're my disciple for sure. You shall know the truth. Do you know the truth's your best friend? It's not letters on a page, it's a person. His name is Jesus. Holy Spirit's called the Spirit of Truth. We beheld him in grace and truth. Jesus is truth made flesh. Isn't that awesome? So the life of Jesus and the words of Jesus are the truth. Oh, so I said, don't, no, don't let anyone else be your teacher. You don't have any other teacher but one, and he's the Christ. So if that's true, why do we let life teach us and circumstances teach us? Why do we even define God through circumstances? Say, well, if this happened, you know, God must. Be very careful. If you can't find what you believe in the life of Jesus, probably ought to cut it out. 
well, yeah, but we were praying, and at this and that, and if God didn't, and you know, he must just. All of a sudden, we're defining God through life instead of Jesus. Sometimes we're destroyed for what we don't understand. Sometimes power and life and death is flowing, and it's through the tongue. Sometimes we're reaping what we've sowed, and none of it has anything to do with God. Truth in Jesus, his life lived is enough. We ought to follow it, amen? You will know the truth, and the truth will what? Truth will make you free. So I don't know about you, I'm a, I'm a truth guy, man. I've camped out, I've read this book a few times in communion with God, and I live the word of God. I feel like in so many ways my life has become that word, the word becoming flesh. You know what I'm saying? That's my intent. I do that intentionally, on purpose, when you're not looking. I even look in the mirror and tell myself that stuff. I say, dude, you're amazing. Blood was shed for you, man. I get close to my eyes. I see the kingdom inside of you, sir. I can see God's pleasure all over your life. His favor adorns you. Yeah, I do that stuff, man. It's what's wrong with me. See, so if I, don't believe, if I don't believe that, I'm going to start believing life around me and who said what and who didn't say what and who did what and didn't do what. All of a sudden, I'm going to be disappointed by people and putting my expectations on people. And all of a sudden, people are set up to fail me or fulfill me. And all of a sudden, I'm no better than the world around me instead of the one that lives inside of me. Amen. You guys all right? Yeah. <laughs> Some of you just looking at me funny. <laughs> like you're manifesting. <laughs> it's all right, they're all coming out. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do you understand men are destroyed for the lack of knowledge? It's not that we're evil, bad people. We didn't wake up. I don't believe God. The gospel has touched our hearts. You're not at this conference because you're an evil person. When you hear somebody talking like this, it's not to locate where you're not. It's to show you where you're called. It's not so you leave here and say, man, I feel hardly feel saved. (laughs) No, it's to expose the lies and remove the things that are holding you back. It's to open the way of truth because truth makes you free. It's not to locate where you're not, it's to show you where you're headed. You always hear in the ear of grace because God is cheering you onward saying there's a whole lot more than maybe we're thinking. Do you get it? So if we continue in the truth, we're gonna know it. Yay, that's a promise. So don't be a 30 day money back guarantee person. We say, okay, I'm gonna go really read my Bible and I'm gonna pray and believe God's gonna, don't put God to the test like that and then get in this little course of time and then decide if it's working or not. As pastors, most pastors can relate to this. You share with people when people will get in a counseling thing and they'll say, well, look, man, I did that, I tried that. And their language gives them away. They've turned the gospel of relationship and intimacy with God into a principle they apply in hopes to get help. So we find a promise that pertains to our life and then we apply it as a principle hoping to get a breakthrough. And then we grow weary in well-doing because the time frame stumbles us because we didn't see change. But the whole time it has nothing to do with faith working through love. It has to do with mechanics and applying the Bible for our sake. So we're already set up to be discouraged. Do you see how twisted that is? Do you see how set up that is? Do you see how self-focused that is? Faith works through love. Not because you have a need. It's because you have a relationship. Faith works because in the midst of your need, you see who God is and how God sees. And you know who you are in the midst of that equation in the face of that need. So your faith is more of a declaration, a proclamation. So you lose your job, you get laid off. It's not, God, why did you let this happen to me? Man, the two people that I thought were getting laid off didn't even get laid off and they don't even go to church. 
Where are you, God? Where have you been? And all of a sudden, you're weighing everything, judging God and weighing the future of your life based on one happening. And you're taking it to God in prayer, and it's not even in prayer. It's, it reveals where you're f- coming from. And actually, the enemy gets a hold of stuff like that. That would make you a pretty easy sit and duck and target, wouldn't it? Just push a few people buttons in your life, and you're in trouble. You guys all right? No, you get alone in that bedroom and say, man, Lord, that really caught me off guard when I got laid off. I wasn't expecting that. But I'll tell you what I rejoice in, that you love me and you're one that provides. You've caused me to be the head and priest of this home and I'm not panicking and I'm not striving and I won't complain. I will stand here and worship you because you have our best interest in hand and you will give me wisdom, direction, and cause me to find favor, not just with you, but with men. And I thank you, God, for this new season in my life. And all of a sudden, people get around you and they can't even tell you were laid off. Why? Because you're not laid off, you're in Christ. You don't become what you're going through, you wear what he went through. And you manifest the finished work. Do you get what I'm saying? Come on, this stuff is simple. Why do I do this at a power and love in the first session? Because if these things, if we're vulnerable to all these things and we're constantly going like this, we're not even seeing the world around us let alone loving them, because we still got enough issues of our own. Come on. Look, I'm not like you see me today, because my ducks are all in a row. There's things I wish would change around me and in my life. There's things in my family I would love to see shift a little and increase. There's, there's always something you could put on the list that you'd love to see God change, tweak, touch, or do. None of that determines who I am today. Who he is inside of me determines that. I'm not forlorn because this didn't happen. I'm not sad because this didn't change. No, he's in me and he doesn't change. Come on, the whole world at one point seemed to be against him. He didn't change. When he's on the cross, it looks like he failed, guys. He's here for three some years, three years at least. We know he's here for three years on the earth. And on the cross, it looks like he failed. Heals all these people, has this amazing track record. The books of the world wouldn't contain if they've written one by one all the things that he did. And yet there he is, dying on the cross, and there's nobody there but a few faithful weeping women that weren't ashamed. Praise God for you women. But when you look at that, it looks like he failed and had nothing to show. You look at things on the outward, you're going to make a mistake. I mean, it looks like Jesus needs one of our church building programs or something. Because he's just not doing well. This is all you got to show for 24-7, three years of 24-7 ministry? Serious, 24-7, man. I mean, a lot of nights he didn't even sleep. The Bible says he's out there talking to the Father. 24-7 24-7 ministry after three years and all you got to show is a few women crying at your feet and you're beaten, and whipped and all the people are rejecting you? Sometimes things ain't what they seem. He knows if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. He raises from the dead, and in about 40 days, he's got thousands of people called the New Covenant, New Testament Church, and they're in the fear of the Lord, and the presence of God is everywhere, and people are getting healed, and miracles, and a few more, now thousands and thousands, and here we are today because of him. But if you look and get rash in a moment, he failed. You weigh things outwardly, you might make a mistake. You look at the way things seem, you just might get deceived. You follow me? The Bible says to guard your heart, out of your heart flows the issues of life. You get to keep your heart pure and clean and keep your heart in a place of love and never forget why your feet are on this planet. Let me tell you why your feet are on this planet. To bear witness of the image of God, to look like your father. The reason you woke up this morning is because mercy let you wake up to give you one more day to look like him. We think we have one more day to apply all his promises to get a breakthrough. Sometimes we got faith scriptures plastered all over our refrigerator and we quote them faithfully in the kitchen while we're doing breakfast because we're hoping it'll release some kind of favor today and we'll get a better parking spot, less traffic, a nice green light, and a boss with a cool disposition. I'm not sure what we're thinking. (laughs) 
the Bible says you have these exceedingly great and precious promises by which we partake of his divine nature. The promises assure that you have everything necessary to look like your father. The promises assure that you have everything necessary to follow the son of God. It says that we, it's 2 Peter chapter 1, that you partake of his divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. That means self-centered, unsatisfiable, selfish desire. When you hear the word lust in the Bible, in the Greek, it doesn't mean pornography and bound to pornography. It just means living for your flesh. Craving for your flesh. What has saved us is we've partaken of his divine nature, which is love, which is not selfish, and we've been sanctified, called out of darkness into the light. We've partaken of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption all around us through self-centered, self-driven desire. Do you see what a Christian is? A denying of yourself. Not an incorporating in some wonderful, magnificent kingdom. It's a denying of yourself, so that kingdom overtakes who you are. You follow me? So I will never preach the gospel any other way. I, Jesus didn't preach it any other way. I will not dangle a carrot in front of you called eternal or everlasting life. It's the, it's the answer of a transformed life. The gospel's a transformed life. You must be born again. A brand new being, a new creature in Christ. Old things whoosh, man, I got this picture, and I'm not sure we're not gonna pursue this, but I don't know how it'll fly in the church, but I got this picture of this big porcelain potty. Big, human size, and doing water baptisms in them. And put them in and teach. Old things pass away and old things come new and you're never again who you used to be and who you thought and what, and then baptize them in that potty. And then snatch them out of the potty and hit the lever. And then somehow it has to be able to be done. And then fill that thing back up. And next, and rip them out of that potty. There's something, if you can grab it, don't get gross with it, just grab it. It says old things going, all things new. If we die in the likeness of his death, that means to sin once for all, Romans 6, then truly we'll rise in the newness of life. That's why water baptism is important. That's why it was right in the gospel when Jesus said, believe and be baptized. And Peter said, repent and be baptized. And the eunuch and Philip in the chariot, there's water. What forbids me of being baptized? It was always in the conversation. Why? Because it was always about the newness of life. It was always about transformation. Somehow along the way, we made it more self-serving And actually, in a lot of circles, water baptism isn't even ever mentioned. We have altar calls of thousands, and nobody even mentions new life. They just mention your, your name in a book. And we don't even water baptize because it's not about new life. It's about, hey, I've confessed him. I've believed on the Lord and confessed him with my mouth and believed him in my heart. So I'm saved. Same frustration, same discouragement, same jealousy, same pride, and all that seems normal. No, it's born again, transformation of life. Put off these things. And he has the whole list there of all the things you became through the fall. Put them off. Why? So you can put on him. That's the way I preach the gospel. I won't even, I'm a fanatic for water baptism, man. You know why? Because it releases a grace for transformation. Because it's a contact point where people can say anything that ever happened to me, anything that ever was or wasn't, I call dead at this point. When I come out of this water, I'm going to live for the first day of my life. And I surrender everything and I trust you, God, with a grace and a wisdom that when I come out of this water, I'm going to live and this will be the first day of the rest of my life. And it will be as if I've never existed before. I'm going under and coming up born Again, Holy Spirit midwife's going to receive me out of the womb of water baptism and present me to the Father, a brand new baby boy. (laughs) You know why water baptism isn't preached strongly? 
because we've taken the emphasis off of transformation of life and we've made it on what we can get from God instead of how we can become more like him. That's what this power and love's all about. Look, if we don't get this point first, we won't walk in love and power. People will still irritate you. You'll draw near to the ones you favor and you'll draw away from the ones that aren't favorable. You won't see with the eye of love. You won't see with the eye of people's potential and destiny. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. We probably ought to learn that and grow in that. Sometimes when people live more unlovely, they need all the more love. Sometimes the more hurting people are, the more the spirit would gravitate towards that, not from that. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's the reason we talk this way right out of the gate because we're not here to just get you to do something cool this week and go out and pray for somebody and maybe see something neat. We want you every day of your life to wake up and know who you are and not let life dictate that anymore. Watch, not even let people dictate that. Like the only right you have is to encourage me. That's the only permission you have. You, you, the only power you have is to cheer me on. You can't stop me, the train's rolling. <laughs> Serious, there's nothing you could do to discourage me. Because my identity comes from him, not your opinion or your thoughts of me. I want you to love me. I want to live upright. I'm not going to live anything willfully to reproach his name. I'm going to live in integrity. But even if you don't appreciate that, it doesn't change what I have. Even if you don't agree with me, I still can go to bed at night with his peace and his presence and wake up and hear his voice and walk in him. (laughs) So you want to get in a place where you're actually free from all men so that you can be given to all men. See, when I got free from me through the gospel, I got free from you. (laughs) So watch why that's important. If I'm free from me, then I'm free from you. If I'm really free from me, I'm free from you. Because if I'm not free from you, I'm still not free from me. (laughs) Serious. Like if I need you to say something for me to feel okay. (sighs) Let's just say it again, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. See, because then I'm set up for disappointment and you for failure. Because if you don't say what I need you to hear, then I'm not okay and I'm not complete, but I can complete in him. You have to be very careful. You don't just wrap Christian words around your confession and yet still need everybody to do and say the right things so that you feel good. You feel good because of the truth. That has made you free. He's already shed his blood. It's already over. You can't talk me out of it now. He already died and rose again. Yay, it's over. It's settled. My life's worth living. Yay. (laughs) The love of God is measured by Christ crucified, not the circumstances of your life. If he didn't love you, he'd have never killed his son on a cross. It pleased the Father to bruise him and cause his soul to grief, making him an offering for sin. Why? So he could obtain you. It pleased him so he could embrace you. That's amazing. You have to let that be number one in motivation, belief, or something else gonna creep in there and matter more. And now you're only okay if, and you're only okay when. And I would do you injustice if I don't share this. If, what I'm sharing now, you can receive as principle, but it has to become yours through communion and relationship. You apply this to your relationship with God. Father, I thank you that you love me so much, so incredibly. My life is so on purpose and so the will of God. There's a time to be born. I wouldn't be standing here if I wasn't your will. You start praying stuff like that, and Father, you love me 
in such an amazing way that through the cross, you've made me completely pure in your sight. You've shown me my life is so valuable and so worth living, and here's the cool thing I'm seeing, Lord. If you see me this way, you see everyone this way. (laughs) Do you get it? Do you see what starts happening in you? All of a sudden, God starts cultivating a heart of love. All of a sudden, when you see people, because you see yourself real clear, and you know who you are, then guess what you start seeing? Who everybody else is. Now you don't have first impressions, presumptions, self-righteous stuff like, oh brother, look at it. You know? Ew, do you see how they are? Well, I don't know, the way they talk just bothers me. You know how we, we've, grown, we've all been that way. Walk in a room, first impressions. Decide who we like and who we don't before we even meet anybody. I don't know, there's just something about her. I'm just staying away from her. I don't know, there's just something about her. (laughs) You know, you walk by, hi, sister. Oh, brother. (laughs) Come on, I'm being real. None of that is existing in love. Because love believes the best and sees the value of everybody. Come on, we've been so trapped in this thing. Some of us have gone to settings to be loved. And to assess the atmosphere only to leave and say, boy, there was no love in that place. Which just proves we don't understand. There should have been. You were there. (laughs) Do you see how it's become all about us? Well, I'm going to go see if this is a loving church. Please don't do that. What are you doing? You're to walk in love. Not go tell. You're not God's called agent assessment crew to test if the church is loving. You're supposed to be love. (laughs) So you go to a church to see if it's loving and then they don't pass your test and then you tell five, seven friends the name of the church you were at and that they weren't loving and then you begin to spread gossip and cancer through the body of Christ. Because you're making it all about you again. Which should have been loving. Because love's inside of us. You guys okay? I'm talking like this. I'm just talking like this. See, the two greatest commandments is love God with everything you are, and the second is just like the first. He really tied the two together and made them one. The greatest commandment is what? Love God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength, and love what? Your neighbor what? Whoa. So if I don't see clear who I am, how can I see clear who you are? I'll love you as I love myself. So if I'm fault finding and nitpicky and introspective with a negative resume and I'm full of guilt and shame and then I'll just relieve the pressure of that by finding what's wrong with you and saying, wow, I guess I'm not so bad. Look at that. You get it? When you're bothered by you and who you are, you'll be bothered by what you see about that in other people. That, that'll just, it'll just, you get it? But if I get alone and look in a mirror and see what God sees, when I turn from that place and look at you, guess what I see? Your potential, your destiny. I see what God says about you. I understand the cross defines you. You don't define you, the cross does. Your potential's in the cross, the finished work of Christ. Do you get it? So whether you know that or not, I can. That's how easy it is to become love, to get alone and receive this gospel and put it on and know that everyone's created to wear this same finished work and this joy. And all of a sudden you look through those eyes that have faced truth and you go, wow, this is true. So you're free from you, now you're free from all men so you can finally love. Because nobody owes you anything. In Romans 12, you owe no man anything but to love. 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction, the goal of the commandment is love. The whole reason we do what we do is to love. And if it's not about love, guys, we've missed it. They'll know us by our love. On the night Jesus was betrayed, what did he do? He broke bread and continued in giving his life in covenant with God so men could enter into fellowship with that covenant. 